We've seen that we can model baskets of goods as just points. So if we have two goods, x1 and x2, then points in this two-dimensional space are baskets of goods. And each point is a different basket. So the next question we're going to ask is which of these baskets are actually affordable to you? In order to answer that question, we have to know a little bit more about you and the circumstances that you face. The first thing we're going to have to know is how much money do you have? And we're going to call that your income. We're going to denote it by I. Next, we're going to have to know how much does X1 actually cost? So we need to know the price of good one. And similarly, we need to know the price of good two. So suppose that you have $500 to spend and the price of good one is 50 and the price of good two is 25. Well, one way to begin to see where the affordable bundles for you lie is to ask how much of X1 could you buy if you bought nothing else? If you spent all your $500 on just X1, where X1 costs $50 per unit, you'd be able to buy 10 of them. So you could buy 10 units, but you'd have no money left over to buy any of the X2 good. So you'd have zero of X2. So in that case, your bundle would lie right here on this axis. You're only buying good one. Similarly, we can ask, what if you spent all your money on good two? You have $500, it costs $25 to buy good two. So 500 divided by 25 gives us 20. So the most you could ever buy of good two is 20 units. And if you do that, you have no money left over for X1. So you'd have zero of X1. And the bundle would lie on the vertical axis. So those are two extreme bundles you could buy where you buy only one of the two goods. But of course, you could do many in-between things. You could spend half of your money on X1. In that case, you could afford five units, and you'd have $250 left over to spend on X2. X2 costs $25, so with $250, you could buy 10. And we'd get another bundle with less extreme and of course, you'll notice that that bundle lies on a straight line that connects these two. So there's a whole series of bundles that you could afford to buy where you spend all of your money. And that line is called the budget line. You could, of course, buy bundles that are inside this little triangle. Because inside this little triangle, you're spending less than your $500. You'd have money left over. But you wouldn't be able to spend anything out here. You wouldn't be able to buy these bundles because if you're already sitting at this bundle, you're already spending all of your money, so buying more of either of the goods would not be possible. Not be possible unless you buy less of the other good. So in this case, we could ask, how much of the good two would you have to give up to buy one more unit of the good one? Well. The good one costs twice as much as good two. So you're going to have to give up two of X2 to get one more of X1 if you're starting at this point. You'd have to go down by two to go over by one, which tells us what the slope of the line is. The slope of the line is minus two. You have to go down by two to go over by one. And that slope has a precise meaning in this graph. It is what we call the opportunity cost of the good x1 in terms of x2. It's the opportunity of consuming x2 that we have to give up in order to buy one more of x1. We have to give up two of x2 to get one more of x1 that's the opportunity cost of the good X1. We could also ask, what's the opportunity cost of the good X2? And it turns out that'll be the inverse of that slope. To buy one more unit of X2, you have to give up half a unit of X1, because X1 is twice as expensive as X2. So the opportunity cost of 
good 2 will be the inverse of that slope. So we can see how you can sort of graphically derive what a budget line would be by just starting with the extreme bundles that you could afford and then drawing the line that connects them, assuming that you always pay the same prices for the two goods. How would we do the same thing if we didn't start by graphing, but we started with the math? What would the budget equation look like? Well, a budget equation would be an equation that tells us your spending is equal to your income because all along that budget line you're spending all of your income. So we'd have to figure out how do we denote spending, that'll be on one side of the equation, and how do we denote income. Well, if we have these numbers, we can figure out how much you're spending on any bundle by just multiplying how much you buy of good one by the price of good one, which is 50 in this case. That's how much you're spending on good one if that's how much you're buying. So x1 here just stands in for the quantity of x1. Similarly, how much you spend on good 2 is just the price of good 2 times how many units of good 2 you buy. When we sum those together, we get your total spending on goods 1 and 2 for any basket that you might buy. And that spending along the budget line has to be equal to your income, and your income in this case is $500. So now we have an equation. We have a budget equation. But it's hard for us to interpret this equation and to see how it graphs unless we get it into the form that we're used to seeing for linear equations. So if you go back to your algebra, you'll remember that the equation of a line is something like y is equal to b plus mx, where m is the slope and B is the intercept, the vertical intercept. That's how we can easily map from an equation of a line to what the line looks like in a graph. So we'd want to get this equation into this form. And our Y in this equation is X2. X2 is on the vertical axis. X1 is on the horizontal axis, so it's like the X here. So to get this equation into this form, we want just X2 on one side. So let's go ahead and do that. We want to subtract 50 times x1 from both sides to get rid of it on this side. So we'd be left over with 25 x2 equal to 500 minus 50 times x1. Then we want to get rid of the 25, so we divide both sides by 25. That'll give us x2 on this side just like the y here, equal to 500 divided by 25, well that's 20, minus 50 divided by 25, well that's 2, times x1. So now we have the equation of a line where this is the intercept and this is the slope, and it's exactly what we graphed here, an intercept of 20 and a slope of minus 2. Now more generally, we can think of how we would uh, write the equation, the budget equation, if we didn't know all of these things. So if we didn't know all of these things, we would have to say that your spending in good one is P1 times X1. And your spending on good two is P2, your price of good two, times how much you buy of good two. So your total spending is those two together. And that total spending on the budget line is going to be equal to your income. Now again, we have an equation that's not in the form of y is equal to b plus mx, so we need to put it into that form to see what it means in terms of intercepts and slopes. So we want to get rid of p1, x1 on this side, so we subtract it out and we get p2 times x2 is equal to i minus p1 x1. Then we want to get rid of the P2 to just have X2 on this side, the way we did here. So we divide by P2 and we get X2 is equal to income divided by P2 minus P1 over P2 times X1. 
So we now have an intercept of income divided by P2. In this case, it was 500 divided by 25, which gives us that 20. And it makes sense that that should be the y-intercept, the x2 intercept. If all we buy is the good x2, then we're going to be able to afford your income divided by the price of good 2. That's how we got that 20. And the slope is minus P1 over P2. P1 in this case is 50, P2 is 25, so that gives us our negative 2 slope. That gives us the opportunity cost of buying the good x1 in terms of x2. So we have here the opportunity cost of buying x1, and here we have the intercept of the budget line. So that's how we generally can represent a budget line. And we can now know that the opportunity cost of x1 in terms of x2 is always going to be equal to p1 over p2. Similarly, the opportunity cost of buying x2 will be the inverse, so it will be p2 over p1.